I'm Nalini and this is Dark Magazine. Today I'm talking to Lainey Taylor, author of Daughter of Smoke and Bone. Lainey grew up with her toes in many oceans and her nose in many books. She studied literature and art and has ed edited travel guide books, illustrated children's magazines and sold her paintings under a bridge in rain and in snow before giving it all up to write full time. She lives in Portland, Oregon with her husband, illustrator Jim DeBartolo and their small daughter Clementine and she's the author of several novels. Lips Touch Three Times was a silver medal finalist for the 2009 National Book Award in the US and then came Daughter of Smoke and Bone which is now a trilogy and it's now complete. Welcome Lainey. Thank you, thank you for having us. It's a great introduction. <laughs> Um, you always wanted to write. How, how did you know that you wanted to write? I, you know, I can't even rem remember a time when I didn't know that was what I wanted to do. I, from the time I was a really small child, I would sit on the porch writing stories, and for as long as I can remember, I sort of identified. You know, I always knew I was going to be a writer, even though it took me a long time to actually write very much, <laughs> to sit down and, and learn how to do it. Um, it was always, there was some faith based on nothing that that was what I would do. <laughs> so what do you like to read and what have you enjoyed over the years? Uh, I read everything. Um, there was a long period of time, you know, in university where I was reading only, you know, literature, classics, um, nothing contemporary. And at the time I was working in an amazing independent bookstore, so I was surrounded by great contemporary books and I was reading only, you know, the works of dead Frenchmen or something like that. <laughs> um, but then, uh, Afterwards, in my 20s, I guess, um, it was actually when Harry Potter came out that I started reading fantasy again. That was my gateway back to the books that I had loved as a child. Uh, so, so that opened the door you know, back to fantasy, and, um, and I'm so glad it did, because when I started really writing again, um, it, was, it was fantasy, and it went a lot better than when I had been trying to write literary fiction. Oh, that's really interesting that you, you tried literary and then switched back to fantasy. I sort of tried. I didn't try very hard. <laughs> I wasn't very strict with myself back then. I've learned to be a lot more strict with myself. So. Bad Ass Beth asked, what inspired you to write YA fiction in particular? What inspired me to write YA? You know, I don't think it was ever really a... It was, I had such an interesting path, sort of, um, you know, I went to art school partly because I had fallen in love with picture books. So after university and all of this, I, I started studying illustration and um, wanting to do children's picture books. And then I started going to uh, writing and illustrating conferences that were geared towards children's books. And, and I was just sort of absorbed in that, that world. And um, when I started writing, it was again in that, you know, inspired by Harry Potter and The Golden Compass and um, Garth Nix. Australian writer and um, and that was really when I started writing again so it was just that was what re-inspired me and that was what I started writing and uh, I never have really been able to figure out why I feel drawn to writing for young young people and young characters but I do <laughs> so. and you do it really well too thank you now you've collaborated on some books with your husband Jim DiBartolo mm -hmm. producing graphic novels how did that collaboration work uh, well, Jim and I met in art school. We actually met on the first day of art school. The first, we were the first two cars in the parking lot on the first day, so he was literally the first person I set eyes on in art school. It was very fortuitous. And um, we, he uh, had gone uh, to art school because he left comic books and wanted to illustrate comic books, whereas I was you know, really wanting to do children's books. And um, we, we knew early on that we wanted to collaborate. And so when I started writing again, it just was natural to do uh, to a first to attempt to do a graphic novel together that I would write and he would illustrate. And so um, we started going to San Diego Comic Con and getting familiar with that industry. And so our first book, my first book, um, and his first book was uh, called The Drowned, and it's a horror comic um, published by Image in 2004 about witches. <laughs> about witches? Mm hmm. So Drowned witches. Oh, okay. So that sounds really interesting. And yet, your husband did the illustrating, and yet you're an artist as well. Mm -hmm. So, what was that like? Coming I don't. My my art style never. It was always sort of more um, sweet and whimsical art for children's picture books, that sort of thing. And actually, as we were walking down the street just now, I saw um, some of my artwork in a window of a of a, of a, use, of a rare bookshop. 
um, which was a really surprise. Um, but his gym style is much more, um, you know, a, be a much better match for my writing style than my own artwork is. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So it, it was a match made. Yes. I was going to say in heaven, <laughs> but maybe in... In uh, Arets, I don't know. No, I don't. <laughs> Um, when you were in the process of selling Daughter of Smoke and Bone, you were wooed with teeth and feathers. <laughs> uh, you mean the film rights? Uh, well, actually, I thought that was for the book, but maybe maybe it was for the film rights. I'm not sure. Oh, I guess, you know, I don't remember if there were teeth involved directly then. I do remember that um, Hodder, who's a British publisher uh, who Hachette, um, New Zealand, would be affiliated with, sent a jar of wishes. Um, Maybe there was a string of teeth attached to that. Later, when I was selling the film rights, there was a lot of teeth came about. <laughs> I have got quite a collection now of teeth and wishbones and skulls and strange artifacts that have been given to me, so that's really fun. Awesome. How is the film coming? Um, it's coming. It's coming slowly. I'm hopeful that you know it's going to start to gain momentum. We've got, a, I think, a cool script um, and a director who's from here, from, uh, dare I try to pronounce it, Melbourne. <laughs> awesome, <laughs> thank you. And uh, yeah, so I'm really hopeful. Yeah, yeah. Ha has any of the casting been done? No. no. What about, um, do, you, do you know if it's gonna be live action or? Yeah. yeah? Mm -hmm. Wow, that'll be interesting. Wow, so I'm, yes, okay. <laughs> Oh, I'm looking forward to seeing Me the too. costumes or the whatever they're going the to be. Character design. Well, I've seen some concept art of the character design, and it's really incredible. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Well, your concept is really incredible, so I can only imagine what it's going to be like on the big screen. Yeah. It'd be one not to miss. <laughs> Well, I fell in love with Daughter of Smoke and Bone in the first chapter when Karu, the protagonist, meets a vampire in the street <laughs> and he's not what you'd expect. Yeah. I guess that was sort of a, a little homage to that first trip to Prague. Um, when uh, Years ago, after Jim and I had done that first graphic novel, we decided to do another one and it was going to be a vampire graphic novel set in Prague. And so we went to Prague to research it and um, spent, you know, almost two weeks there just sort of walking around deciding where the vampires would live and hunt in Prague. And then we ended up not doing that book. Um, so, but it was all still in there waiting to be used. And, and uh, so maybe that was a little bit of an homage to that book that, that never was. Well, I thought it was absolutely <laughs> fantastic. You've subverted the angel trope. Hmm. It's been done and yet you've done it differently. How did this come about and why? It's funny, you know, I, was, I had been working on Daughter of Smoke and Bone for a while when I, I heard that there were some angel books coming out. That somebody had, it was becoming a thing and I was sort of, you know, horrified because I didn't want to be, you know, coming in late on a thing. Um, but can't really worry about that at a certain point. It was too late to worry about. Um, but I, you know, I never, you know, I never in, considered using, you know, that I was using Christian lore really in any way. But I think that the underlying idea in all my books, not just this one, um, that's never really discussed except for Brimstone maybe has a line that sort of refers to it, is that I like the idea that uh, sort of all of human folklore and mythology, um, the notion that what if it were based on glimpses that humans had had of something that was real and we had only seen just enough to create our, an entire narrative out of a glimpse and of course what we create says more about us than about the, the reality and so because humans have such a beauty bias um, that we would see a glimpse of an angel or a seraph as in, and we would um, assume that they were good, that they were holy. We would create this story um, based on nothing more than the fact that they were beautiful. And so mm. that was really where that idea came from. And, and uh, you know, I, people tell me a lot that they think that I made the angels evil and the monsters good, but that's not the case. You know, they're really just, they're, they're different races living in the same world and, and they're, you know, just as in our world when two peoples are at war, there's, you know, not one good side and one bad side, mm. just people fighting. And you have Romeo and Juliet in yes, the middle. Yes, I do. <laughs> yes. How do you write what, on the surface in book one, seemed to be a YA romance and yet you've weaved serious issues like racism, genocide and abuse in relationships into it. And it is still a really readable YA <laughs> uh, trilogy. Thank you. I mean, 
I think I didn't really ever, you know, I didn't set out to write a certain kind of story. I really, um, I had been a very planning oriented writer before and out of fear, you know, um, that I thought I had to know exactly what was going to happen before I wrote it because if I, it, for some reason it seemed really terrifying to me back then, the idea that I could take a wrong turn in the story and, and then have to back up and I would have written things that I didn't have to write. I mean, I don't know, I don't know why, now I don't know why it was so scary, but it was. And so I used to plan everything and, and the, uh, the process of writing this trilogy has taken me completely away from that. Now I'm a much more spontaneous writer um, and this, it grew. I, I never had an, I didn't have a, a premise, I didn't sit down with a big idea. I sat down and characters appeared and I sort of let them lead and I, I would think, stop and, and think and brainstorm and figure it out a little bit as I went but I never, I didn't think about themes, it just unfolded and, um, and then I would stop and think about it a little bit but it wasn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't know I was going to write a war book until I was well into trying to write it and realize that what I had set myself up for with the end of Daughter of Smoke and Bone and um, so it kept it kept surprising me and I just kept going with it. <laughs> so you started planning and then you turned into a pantser? I did start as a planner. I'm a perfectionist in the, like, the worst sense and that's why it took me so long to learn how to finish a novel. Um, so I used to do a lot of outlining and um, and with this book I never was able to do that. It, it resisted my efforts to plan early on and, um, and now I don't I mean, I still, I still, I need to have a story beat or something that I'm working towards, something that it, it excites me narratively, but, um, but it's not by any means an outline or a grand plan. You know, with, uh, say, with Days of Blood and Starlight, um, as I was trying to figure out what that book would be, the one idea that finally came to me that excited me about the book and made me think I had a story was, without giving any spoilers, it's the thing that happens now, it happens at the end with Ziri and Thiago, that that was the story beat that I was working towards. I didn't know it would come at the end. I thought it would come at the end of the first act. So, but like chasing that moment is what gave me the story, um, rather than actually being able to ever outline it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Because I thought it would happen early on, and I, yeah. It's funny to think back and like how little I really knew about the story when I sat down at the beginning. But, um, but now I think, it's much more fun to write that way than to know exactly or think you know exactly what's going to happen. So have you started working on your next book? Mm -hmm. How has this experience impacted on your writing for the next book? It definitely, um, you know, it's a very different kind of book and uh, I think because it's, it's got a, a major historical component it feels very different because I have had to do research mm -hmm. in a different way. So. I have been doing a lot of reading and trying to find my footing in the, in the historical era, which is 1860s New York City. Um, so trying to feel comfortable writing in that world in that time. But otherwise, I, I'm curious to see how it will go as I get deeper into it and what, I, what lessons I will take with me. Because the tendency is always after finishing a book to think you've learned some major lesson and that it will, it will be easier and that's almost never true. <laughs> Every book has its own set of challenges so I'm sure this one will too but um, I feel much more comfortable being spontaneous now um, and knowing that really there's you know, there's no mistake that is really so dire that you can't just write it again. I suppose it's about having enough time, giving yourself a space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not being afraid. The main thing. Can you tell us a bit more about your next project? Because that sounds really interesting. Yeah, no, I'm not talking about it yet. It's science fiction in that set in that era. So I am. Um, I'm not good at talking about books early on because I find that it would, I'll start trying and then I, it sounds bad to me and I cringe and then I, I second guess the, the idea and so it'll be a while before I feel like I'm ready to verbalize the you know the idea. Well, can I ask, um, if it's set in 1860s New York and it's science fiction, does that mean it's steampunk? It is not steampunk. Oh, well, that's going to be different. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> um, you've, you've, had, you've done a lot of different things between um, studying writing and literature and studying art. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you give to aspiring writers these days? Um, what lessons have you learned? Well, I have a lot of advice for writers, but I think, and this isn't, this isn't fall under advice, this is a sort of, because everyone has to pursue their own educational, you know, um, 
desires, I guess, but for myself, I wish, or if I had it to do over again, uh, for one thing, I would, um, I would take more science classes. Uh, and I would not be an English major or a literature major, I would major in history. Um, because I, wow. yeah, I think that the things that I studied in school um, really prepared me to write maybe literary criticism, um, which is of much more limited value to me now than, um, than if I, you know, had a, a more solid foundation in history or, you know, I find that I, I could sit down and read a novel on my own in a much easier way than I could sit down and sort of, say, synthesize uh, 1860s New York <laughs> for myself, you know, reading a stack of, uh, of nonfiction books this, this, this tall. So um, I think that it would have been really valuable for me to have that. Um, and yeah, so that and also just always feeling sort of the gaps in, in my science education, physics especially, um, writing science fiction, you just, it's important. And uh, so I, I kind of wish I could go back and fill in those holes without or just download it from the matrix. That's what I really wish. <laughs> <laughs> that would be really yeah. handy. <laughs> yep. So speaking of the matrix, <laughs> what other um, like things in the pop cultural zeitgeist do you appreciate? I'm not going to be able to think of it. I mean, I'm always terrible when it's such a broad topic. I'm like, uh, everything. Um, you know, I don't. And this sounds snobby, but it's not intended that way. I don't really watch TV um, because I just have found I don't have time anymore. But mm -hmm. I like TV. I'm not disparaging it. It just uh, so I'm really sort of out of it as far as what's really you know what people are watching now. And um, I go to Comic Con in San Diego, and and I'm aware of the things there are. But you know I don't I don't you know um, since I have a five year old daughter, uh, in order to get a full work day, I have to work after she goes to bed as well, and so does Jim. So um, we don't. I, I read a lot uh, as much as I can, which is less than I would like, but TV just doesn't happen, and movies not nearly as much as I would like. But uh, sort of in the old days, I, I was really a lover of Buffy. Um, you know, I'm a fan of Lord of the Rings, and many things that I can't think of right now. <laughs> Having been put on the spot, they all immediately disappear. Yes. yes, yes. I know, I think I just need to get like a list tattooed on my arm. You're, you're currently touring Australia and you're about to head up to Brisbane for the Writers' Festival. How are you finding Australia? I love it. I, you know, I've had a very brief glimpse of Sydney and now a very brief glimpse of Melbourne and Melbourne. And uh, I love it. I, I can't wait to come back and bring my family back and actually get to be a tourist. Yeah. And explore all the touristy places. Yes. Apart from this, this book that you have, um, that you're researching and you're, you know, only dangling tiny weenie glimpses, <laughs> promises of the future in front of us. Is there anything else that you have planned for the future? Mm -hmm. uh, well, in the most immediate future, I have a, a short story coming out in an anthology in a couple of months. It's called, in the anthology is My True Love Gave to Me, which is edited by Stephanie Perkins, and it's um, 12 romantic holiday stories with some great writers that I love, like um, Stephanie, uh, Rainbow Rowell, uh, Holly Black, Kelly Link, David Levithan, um, really an amazing collection. And the, the spine of the British edition, which I think maybe, I don't know if you'll get that one here or not, ha is hot, but not the spine, the pages are hot pink, so <laughs> wow. I'm, uh, I'm pretty excited to actually see that, that in reality. Um, but I also have a, an adult book that is um, that I've, you know, found a little bit of time to work on here and there uh, around the edges that will probably be my next book after the current one. And uh, I'm pretty excited about that one as well. It's been, it's been swimming around in there for a long time. So. Can you tell us anything about that at all? Uh, it's contemporary and it has a, a small fantasy element or magical realism element, but it's much more grounded and less high fantasy than, uh, say, Daughter of Smoke and Bone. So it's a little bit more like the first novel of Game of Thrones, but set on Earth. <laughs> I, I, I probably very little similarity between Game of Thrones and. Oh, I use that as an example because people say, but it's not really fantasy. And then the dragons come. <laughs> yeah, no, no dragons. It's set, you know, it's contemporary, 2014 or whatever. I love it, you know. Okay. <laughs> um, CJD asks In a battle between Dracula and Frankenstein's monster, who do you think would win? <laughs> Frankenstein. 
who, who even talks about Frankenstein, really? What is Frankenstein capable of? I don't really I don't feel like I know what Frankenstein could do. Probably Dracula. Fair so enough. Dracula. I don't know. What do you think? Um, I look at the question and I think, good old CJD. <laughs> She's my horror reviewer. Okay. I don't dare have an opinion. Because All right. She needs to. Then she needs to uh, say who she thinks and why. So I will tell her. Okay. Because I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you very much for thank talking you. to Dark Matter. Thank you. So it was really fun. <laughs>